Okay, um, I think we're, uh, we're ready to begin. So the plan is that we will uh, just have a, a fairly casual conversation for uh, as long as 45 minutes or whatever before drinks. Um, and during that time, you should all freeze to death, according to the, <laughs> uh, according to the plan. Or you wear your coat. <laughs> or you wear your coat. Uh, but first, I want to give uh, Sally the opportunity to um, rebut many of the comments that have been made. <laughs> no, just to say a few general words. Yeah. Just before Philip starts grilling me with all kinds of questions I can't answer, I, I mostly wanted to say I, this has been an extraordinary day, and I really appreciate everything people have said, and th those who had critiques held back on them, and you all said nice things, and it is actually unbelievably gratifying to think that people actually read your work. You know, <laughs> the, the first time I published a book, I, I, this was my dissertation, I made it into a book, and I... I, it was called Urban Danger, and I, it was so exciting. It got published. It was a lot of work, you know, copy editing and so on. And it went out to the world, and then the book showed up. And I sort of expected there was going to be a big kind of response or reaction of some sort. And, and it just kind of quietly slipped away. And I thought, you know, it's maybe like it falls into a lake, and there's a little ripple, and then it's gone. And, and that's the dilemma of a scholar. You, you never know if anybody is ever going to read what you do or think about it or whether it's going to make a difference. And I mean, in, in my case, I've just been kind of driven by my curiosity to, to look at various different problems. And it is really wonderful to see that people have read it and actually found it helpful. And I'm tickled that a lot of the anthropology graduate students are here because <laughs> they are moving down the same path. And it's, I hope, encouraging for them to see that whatever you do now that you feel like you're working in isolation can really have an impact on other people and they can hear it. And the other thing that I have to say was really surprising for me about today is people told stories about talking to me about things that I have no recollection of. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm, I'm glad the stories are about nice things I said. Who knows what other things I said that they didn't tell me. But it's, it's kind of a scary thing as you sort of go through a long life that these things happen that you don't remember. But I do have wonderful feelings about all the things that you have said and a spectacular group of papers that just really spoke to each other and worked together in ways that were truly amazing. And all of you brought such wonderful expertise and thinking to problems of human rights and law and anthropology. I think we have to, you know, I'd love to see all of these papers published together in a, you know, very short, accessible <laughs> book that other people will read. So I'm really grateful to all of you for coming. And I, I guess I'll say one more thing before Philip starts asking me questions. It, it may seem to you like I've worked on a lot of different topics. And we didn't really talk about some of my earlier work on things like colonialism in Hawaii and urban crime and urban danger. And I, I sometimes find, as I look back on the set of issues that I've dealt with, that it, it could look a little incoherent. And uh, as I tell students who are trying to write tenure reviews, tenure statements, and so on, the trick is to try to come up with a reasonable narrative about how all this fits together. <laughs> <laughs> and I think I could do that if I, if I worked on it. And I, I have on occasion. And people seem sort of persuaded. But I also think I've been really fortunate to just kind of find things that seem really interesting to me that I've pursued. And there, there are underlying connections. But if you all think there's some kind of diversity, well, you're probably right. But maybe that's just what happens when you let your curiosity govern where you go next. Anyway, so that was what I wanted to say. And to thank you all so much for being here and for all your wonderful papers and commentaries. I wasn't going to say this, but your first comment brought back a, a very funny memory, actually, which is relevant in this context, which was... Uh-oh, what did um, I say? No, it was one of the great moments in my life as a youngster when I was invited to the home of Sally Falk Moore um, in Cambridge. And um, her husband was there, and, and he was cooking... And he told me that he'd recently taken up cooking or whatever. And I think the reality was that Sally got appointed to Harvard and he didn't get offered a job at Harvard or whatever. Um, but he then went on at some length and said, you know, 
I'm done with this academic stuff, you produce a book and then, I don't know, three years later someone writes a review somewhere and that's the feedback. <laughs> now that I'm cooking, you'll be giving me feedback in an hour from now. <laughs> <laughs> Is a fairly eminent scholar, too. Right. Barrington Moore, right? Right. A vastly superior uh, form of um, interaction with the audience. Um, so uh, why don't we start with the issue that, that you raised? Um, I was just joking with Sarah that maybe um, one could look at your uh, career trajectory and say that you had uh, attention deficit disorder. <laughs> <laughs> um, See, I got ahead but, of you on that one. <laughs> But I also heard from uh, what uh, Richard said earlier uh, that one might be able to say, no, you know, you started with community justice, you moved to uh, colonial, post-colonial Hawaii, there was issues of justice, then the international dimension of that justice, then on to violence, then on to domestic violence, then on to rights. Uh, I mean, is there really a, a trajectory there that just follows, or do you have a sort of, uh, not a belief, but is it your view that it's better to move on, that you don't actually <laughs> want to be stuck on one particular topic uh, and follow it all the way through? Well, I sense that this is a challenge to give the narrative that tries to stitch it all together. I, I, I'll give it a try because there really is a, a logic to the whole thing, and this might be interesting to those of you sort of starting off on your academic careers. I, I did my first book on how people live in high crime neighborhoods. I, book was called Urban Danger, and that was because my PhD advisor told me I'd never get a job as a legal anthropologist, so I had to study cities. Um, he was wrong, but in any case, it's probably not the first time. But in the middle of doing this study, which is, was really not exactly what I wanted to do, I found that there were people who lived in low-income neighborhoods who were going to court against their partners or their boyfriends or so on to sort of assert justice, and a lot of people who were making complaints about consumer problems. So I said, you know what, maybe I can look at what people like this, relatively poor people, do when they go to court and what happens. And then, of course, the mediation craze hit, and uh, this was a subject of a lot of interest in uh, law and society and other social science fields. Uh, Rick Abel wrote a very uh, important book on the politics of informal justice. Actually, it was an edited book, but so, yes, the, but there was a, he masterminded this, so that there was a kind of concern about whether this was second-class justice or not, so I thought I'd study mediation and dispute resolution, uh, which, in the middle of that project, I, I had a Gluck, Gluckman, Gluckmonian, a, f a framework from Max Gluckman that I decided was all wrong, and I was reading critical theory and part of something called the Amherst Seminar, which Christine Harrington here knows about, and I changed my theory in the middle, not a good idea, um, but then I ended up sort of looking at the way the court exercises its power over working class litigants who come there, which brought me to the question of legal consciousness. You could see Marxism was creeping in. Uh, and then I wanted to look at how legal consciousness changed under conditions of colonialism, where you had a dual legal system. And I thought, well, I should go study British colonialism, that's what everybody else does, but I, I'm not very good at languages. And then I went to a conference in Hawaii, again with Christine, who is here. We, uh, and I looked around and said, you know, this looks like a very colonial place. It was actually taken over by the US in 1899. It became a state, which does not mean it was decolonized in 1959, but it really tracks the same time period as British colonialism, at least in Africa. So I decided to talk about Hawaii is a colonial space, and I did a historical study, but I also wanted to find out what happens when you introduce a new legal system to a system society that has a very different set of laws. So I came up with the idea of talking to people in the local courts of a small town in Hawaii called Hilo about how they felt about the legal system. Well, it turns out the kinds of cases that were in these lower courts were like traffic violations, people who didn't pull aside when there were 13 cars ahead of them on the road. I mean, it wasn't going anywhere. But in that same town, there was a domestic violence program that was just started by, interestingly, somebody from the Lower East Side, New York, who'd gone to this little Hawaiian town 
and they were really trying to transform women's ideas about themselves and violence through introducing a new legal regime. So here was the case that I wanted to look at, and it happened to be about domestic violence, which wasn't that I had intended to study that, but it was really the chance to see the kind of imposition of an alien law that was fundamental to the colonial process. So I did a study of the historical imposition of Western law in 19th century Hawaii using old court records, which intrigued me because the kinds of cases in these 19th century court records in Hawaii were very similar to what I just looked at in New England. Family, neighborhood, you know, drunken, violent, sort of everyday violence kinds of cases. And yet here I was in 19th century Hawaii and not in 1980s Salem and Peabody, Massachusetts. So I did the historical piece, and I did the contemporary kind of imposition of law, and I wanted to put those into one book, but it, it never sort of fit. Um, and then I thought I'd write a book about domestic violence in Hawaii in general, and one of my colleagues told me nobody would ever read such a book. So this is, that was Austin, Sarah. This is how things go in, in the world of academia. You never kind of know. So there is this, there's a logic here. And so then I, <laughs> am you persuaded? And then I wanted to study, so I see it got more and more global in general. And then I came across the idea of looking at human rights, kind of legal pluralism. And I wanted to find a phenomenon to look at how do these local problems get translated into the global. And so I thought, well, should I look at indigenous rights or women's rights and decide on women's rights because for political reasons, actually, not being indigenous, I thought it would not really be appropriate for me to work on this topic. So I started looking at how women's human rights, particularly violence against women, became global. It, so you see, it all, it all makes sense. And in the cost, course of looking at these human rights systems, I began to see people doing counting and quantification. And I came across Meg Satterthwaite's work on quantification, which I found very inspirational, because she'd started to look at this, and she was way ahead of me, on how you analyze what it means to begin to use quantification and indicators for things, which led me into what originally began as a book to say that we need to get rid of all indicators. Um, I got a little pushback on this one, so I, actually quite a lot of pushback, so I kind of moderated that a little bit, um, and that became the quantification book. So it looks like a really different topic, but I hope you can see there at least is some continuity, because I ended up looking at the same kinds of human rights issues in this book that I had looked at in, uh, in my other earlier work on human rights. So the book looks at trafficking indicators, human rights indicators, the project that Meg talked about, and um, violence against women indicators, all of which represent these kinds of constructions of the social problem, which then gets measured, and it's this constructivist project that I was particularly interested in. So then the next thing was indicate, uh, infrastructure, which Benedict Kingsbury and I got interested in, which is a little bit of a shift, but it's actually, we've taught two semesters of classes at the law school and had mostly anthropological speakers and literature that has been a really interesting engagement with the way law students think about this material, because anthropologists have been looking at indicators, I mean infrastructure, but not thinking about problems of legal regulation and control, and so this has been really very productive uh, engagement, which we would like to do more with, but we sort of haven't figured out quite how to do that. Um, and of course, then we also had this wonderful indicators project where Benedict and Kevin and I worked together, produced an edited book, and many conferences and discussions about this. So you could see these things sort of expand and grow, and there's always an element of serendipity, I have found in my work. You sort of never know when this thing's going to come along that seems fun and you want to follow it. Uh, and then after a while, I find that what used to seem so exciting doesn't look nearly as exciting as that other new thing out there. <laughs> and it's best if you finish the last thing before this <laughs> new thing happens. So anyway, so anybody who's trying to write a tenure narrative, I, I can give you good advice. <laughs> it's, it's a matter of trying to find the theme that runs through it all, which usually can be found, but it sometimes takes a little doing. Okay, so I'm going to take a vote now, if that was convincing or not. <laughs> 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 right. Um, 
Is there a normative agenda? Um, are you just this um, deeply intellectual professional anthropologist who goes wherever the discipline takes oh, you? Uh, or is it, is it more than coincidental that you've got strong feminist uh, human rights um, inequality uh, and related uh, interests that seem to shine through from the work? This, of course, is an awkward question for a social scientist talking to legal <laughs> folks who always get frustrated because the social scientist says, well, I'm not making a normative judgment. I'm simply doing a theoretical problem. But of course, when we choose what we work on, we obviously have concerns about issues that we care about and political commitments. And it's interesting to me that in anthropology, we have lots and lots of research on left-wing progressive organizations and relatively little on right-wing organizations. And I myself spent a little time when I was working on domestic violence studying a conservative evangelical church in this little town in Hawaii. And I, I you know, it, it just was so dis different from my own values that it was hard to do. That, that being said, the, the goal of the research is not really to fix things. I remember years ago I was studying mediation and, and there was a program at Harvard, um, what was it called? program on negotiation, I think, and I gave my little talk on mediation, and they said, okay, but is mediation a good thing or not? And I resisted answering that question, although, it, it, you know, my answer could obviously have been, it depends, which is sort of a cop-out. So I clearly choose my problems and topics depending on my own values and concerns, and I do have sort of overarching concerns about social justice and feminism and equality and, you know, the thing that I've always been interested in is power and how it's operated and who is powerful and who is not and those kinds of issues. So in that sense, I guess it's normative, but I'm not trying to fix things. You know, I'm not, I don't really come up with recipes of how we could do it all better. And I think in that sense, I think that's one of the differences between the kind of social scientist that at least I am and a lot of what happens in the legal profession. Because I think there's a, a more instrumental agenda. You see a problem, and then you want to figure out how to fix it, or at least develop strategies and techniques that might ameliorate it. And I think that's probably the major difference between what social scientists do and what lawyers do. Now, you may all disagree with me, but I've been thinking about this for a long time, and the argument that law is normative and social science isn't, I, I don't think, is actually an accurate distinction. But I imagine you all have ideas about this, too. About law Okay. Uh, no, I mean, I, I, I'd love to uh, contest it, but this is not the occasion. You can to, do that. Well, no, just <laughs> in, the, in the sense that, uh, you know, so many people have spoken today about how important your work has been to them uh, to help them to understand things, and most of those people have then gone on to say, so I've used that to <coughs> try to get a better sense of how we might better approach this issue, in other words, I've used it for normative reasons, and so much of your work seems to have normative dimensions, even if you eschew them. Um, I, I didn't. And I, well, <laughs> <laughs> I said it's normative, but it's not instrumental. Okay, all right, right? okay, all right, I'll, 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 uh, I'll settle for that. Um, so, uh, on a different uh, topic, um, one of the things, as I said, that came through today is so many people said, um, you know, Sally is, uh, is even better than sliced bread or whatever. Uh, no, they expressed, you know... I, I great, paid them all, it's all right. <laughs> they did express great warmth, great um, uh, appreciation of the way in which you had collaborated and encouraged and so on. Um, but there's almost no joint authorship um, I would have thought that someone who works so much with other people and is always so engaged in different uh, scholarly enterprises and so on would have ended up co-authoring some or a, a larger number of works than you have. Has that a been a deliberate <laughs> choice not to go down that road? Well, I will say I have co-authored some things and... 
I guess it's because I kind of like writing by myself. Um, so it's, and the co-authoring experiences I've had have been very good. And I have done a lot of collaborative work. Um, I, I don't know, actually, I have thought about this, and I don't know quite why I find it's easier to sort of write when I just write what I think than it is to collaborate with others. But as I say, I, I've done some collaboration with other scholars on some of my articles, <laughs> not on a book. Now I'm feeling defensive. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, yeah, I should probably have done more, but um, no, it no, just, no, you know, it's not a, uh, not a critique, it's just a No, question. it's an interesting observation, though. I sometimes have thought about this, and it isn't that I haven't learned an enormous amount from other people. It's just writing for me is kind of a solitary occupation. It sounds bizarre, but I find it kind of relaxing, because um, sort of me and my computer are talking to each other, and, you know, you can sort of have that kind of control about what you're saying and what you're thinking. Uh, and then you talk to people, and then you go back and sort of commune with the, the words themselves. So it, I guess it has to do with my writing process, really. And I, I know a lot of people find it stressful, so I think I'm a little weird. <laughs> um, but, you know, particularly when my children were teenagers, and, you know, and there was the dog, and then there was the computer. <laughs> but, but now they've all, the forms of calming, but now they've all grown up, and they're wonderful. Both of them, and my daughter Sarah is here, and my husband Paul, both of them, and my brother Rob, so I have a lot of family here, and my sister-in-law. Talking about family, um, what did your parents do to you to generate three academics? Um, <laughs> Rob, for those of you who don't know, is a, a ne'er-do-well who only has, <laughs> only has a Nobel Prize in economics. Um, Sally's uh, twin sister, Patricia, was a psychologist and uh, teacher, as well as working for UNICEF. Yes, she taught at uh, Cal Poly for many years. Right. So mm -hmm. how the hell do parents produce three academics? What's uh, the recipe there? I, I wonder that myself. It's a, you know it's not just three academics, but three social scientists. Um, we each picked a different piece of the social science world. Uh, my father was a chemist. My mother was an elementary school teacher. I, I don't know what they did to, to get us all into academia. Um, and uh, there was never any pressure to do it. Actually, when... I mean, was there the proverbial uh, dining room table uh, conversation of uh, trying to provoke reflection on uh, deep issues or...? Uh, I I don't remember no. that, no. <laughs> what, what there was was a little feminist resistance on the part of my sister and me because my father expected that my brother would definitely go to graduate school and do, don't mind I saying so, be a physicist, which he didn't do. And my sister and I were expected to be secretaries. And the idea, this is a while ago, but the idea was that if you're a secretary and you're responsible, you can get a fair amount of you know, responsibility, and so that's a good thing. And my sister went to secretarial school to learn how to do her hair and her makeup and things. Um, and we both had to learn to type. You know, This was when we had typewriters. And I guess, to some extent, we kind of resisted that. I mean, I don't mean to say I was oppressed. We did get sent to a good college. And, um, but I think it was a time when there was just the beginning of feminism and the idea that we didn't have any choice about our professions and that only the, the male child was going to be the academic. You know, it generated a certain level of resistance in me. So we had to follow his way, his, his path. He, he was ahead. You got your, dis your degree before we did, I believe. But you're older, that's right. So I was okay. Yeah, so, but there was no expectation that my sister and I should be academics at all. So was it Wellesley then? You both went to Wellesley. Yes, we, but then we, you know, that, uh, we didn't want to go to the same college, but if you're identical twins, you, you, know, you end up preferring the same college, which <laughs> is okay. Were you uh, inseparable as identical twins, or were you trying to go your own ways? Uh, we were, when we were young, my parents dressed us alike, and nobody could tell us apart. And so I would answer to either name, and people would keep giving us you know, things with names on them. And then sometimes people would say, how do you tell yourselves apart? <laughs> Which, if you think about it, is a 
really weird question to ask. <laughs> and, and then there were moments in college where I remember some fr a friend of mine went up to my sister and started telling her all about her love affairs and her problems. And after about 45 minutes, my sister said, I don't think you th I'm not the person you think I am. Or something. <laughs> I, it, was, it must have been a low moment for this. But, you know, if you talk for 45 minutes without getting any response, you know, maybe you deserve that. So, um, so we, uh, I, I don't remember what the question was that got me just, on the subject just, of were, were you, uh, Well, uh, of, as you, as you developed at university, for example, were you really oh, we very close or did you deliberately or otherwise oh, so go So we, we saw a lot of each other in college, but we had to keep separate from each other because the endless confusion problem was there. And then she went off to California and became a hippie, and, and I got married and went to Berlin with my husband, who was spying on the East Germans. Um, for the mili U.S. military. I wasn't really quite as bad as that sounded. So, so we went two very different paths for a while, and then we got back together again um, as we got a little older and saw a lot of each other. Did some hiking together in the Sierras with all of our family, which is really nice, and a variety of other things. So, yes, but it's, you know, it's an interesting experience being an identical twin. Was it? Has it did it uh, shape any of your... <laughs> Understandings of life later on, being a twin. It, it um, I, I don't know. It, it makes you not expect that people pay a lot of attention to you because they only see a pair. <laughs> I, I mean, it's very odd to be always thought of only in two and not as one, and it means the sense of self is a little bit differently configured, I suppose. Um, and to have two different names and you know <laughs> to be indistinguishable. Which, mm. you, you know, people could tell us apart, but, you know, you'd have to work on it. Mm. Um, back to the professional side, you're getting the Boas medal, uh, I don't medal know prize, if there's whatever. a medal to it. I, oh. I, I th it's a prize. Now, don't, don't be bitter. No, no. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, I, I don't even know if there's a thing to it. Any of you know? I don't know. I'll find out if there's a thing. I think there's probably not. Might be a boa. <laughs> um, but uh, um, I mean, but it's it's a pretty uh, <laughs> uh, it's a high uh, high achievement, obviously, in the field. Margaret Mead was mentioned before. Uh, Claude Levi Strauss and various other people have received it. Um, if someone said to you, what is the contribution that you think you've made that's been most important in the field? Uh, or if after the, uh, Bo <coughs> after the BOAS non-medal has been awarded, <laughs> you're stuck in a bar with an envious colleague who says, what the hell did you do to deserve this medal? <laughs> what are you going to say? I don't have any idea. <laughs> I, I don't feel particularly deserving of it. I, I will say that uh, two of my wonderful students who are now all finished uh, helped to make this happen. Matt Canfield, who's here, and Ram Natarajan, who's not, uh, along with the president of a APLA, oh, Maris Khan, so I don't have to justify the acronyms, the Association of Political Legal Anthropology. Um, and and um, it, it, I feel very honored that people suggested me and nominated me for this prize and um you but know, i'm going to push you further to um, not be modest but just to say what so what piece of your work do you uh, do you feel proudest of is there any aspect that you think you have really broken through and created something that has change the way people see things? Oh my goodness, that's a, a high bar to ask of anybody. Um, well, many of us here think that you have met that in a number <laughs> of areas, that's why I ask. <laughs> well, that's very, that's very generous of all of you. Um, as I say, you know, writing and researching is kind of an isolated process, you know, you're just sort of sitting there doing it yourself because you enjoy it and it's interesting. Um, I think one of the things that I did, and I'm not sure that this is what's behind the Boas Prize, but I, I mentioned it because Richard Wilson was really part of it, was, and, and Mark Goodale as well, was the reformulation of the way anthropologists think about human rights from this stale universalism, relativism approach and to, to something that's much more practiced and engaged. 
And Richard's early books and conferences were very influential in making that transition. And then Mark and I edited a book called The Practice of Human Rights, which is very much pursuing this. And he's continued to write about human rights in this much more nuanced practice way. And I think that has been a big shift in maybe certainly in anthropology, I don't know about the social sciences in general, about how we think about this as a kind of a social process, which I think is a very different way. And when I hear people saying, you know, human rights, the end of human rights, it's gone, I think this fails to take into account all the ways in which people in everyday space, lives, places, talk about human rights, think about human rights, use the language, even though they may not ever go to the treaty bodies or a, you know, file a complaint with CEDAW or anything in the formal system, but it represents a discourse that not only provides a way of framing your problem, which is what I saw you know, with women facing domestic violence, you'd say, you know, they'd say this is just the way marriage is, and the people running the program, the domestic violence program, would say, but actually it's a crime, and, and you don't have to put up with it, and they'd say, that, oh, yeah. Well, maybe that's right. And when your husband had sex with you and you didn't want to, maybe that was rape. And the women would say, well, it felt like a rape. So, you know, you can see this reformulating of experience through a language like the language of human rights, which, so it has that power, even though you may not be interacting with the formal system at all. But the other thing the human rights language does, and so I guess what I'm saying is that focusing on the practice of human rights has this advantage is it creates alliances. And it it's a way to frame your particular problem that other people can understand because it's the same language. So one of the projects that I did was to study uh, women's NGOs in four different places. This never turned into a book. But anyway, we, had, we looked at my colleague, Peggy Levitt, and I looked at two NGOs in Beijing, two in Baroda in India, two in Lima, Peru, and then two in New York City. And uh, the interesting thing about the New York City project was this was an effort by uh, an NGO to pass a law in New York City that put together CEDAW and CERD, in other words, women's rights and anti-race discrimination rights. And they came up with a law which they tried to get the city council to pass, which you'll be astounded to hear didn't pass. But in order to do this, they created a coalition of groups within New York City, housing groups, poverty groups, uh, all sorts of social justice groups doing their own thing, but they all could see their work as kind of human rights work. And this provided a way for them to form a collaborative that linked together their various different issues. So I think when you think about human rights as discourse and practice, you can see these capacities of culturally constituting problems in ways that people can share and form alliances with that are really very important. So I, I, that might be a contribution. I, I would, should also say that, and that's sort of you know, the Human Rights and Gender Violence book as well. The other thing that I've been really amazed by is that my critique of quantification, which I thought would get a lot of pushback to it, hasn't, well, there, I have gotten some pushback from people who really like numbers. And I, I spoke to a group of development economists in Copenhagen who just really hated my whole argument because they'd spent their whole lives, you know, these are retired development economists and they spent their whole lives working on numbers and they didn't like that. But I've had responses and interests from, you know, all sorts of groups looking at the limits of the numerical. In Cambridge, I went to a conference, and people who were looking at uh, information technology, and from all sorts of areas where there's beginning to be a concern about what this tendency to quantification means for our society in general. And, and that's been uh, the diversity of fields where people are responding to that has been kind of interesting. It's been a little less response from anthropology, actually, because you know we're, we're not so concerned about it. And as I say, when I began thinking that indicators were all to be eliminated, that there was some critique. I, I think the, the high point of the response to that book, however, was when I got invited to a conference at the World Bank. Who, who would have thought the World Bank would want me to come? And they had a conference they called Disruption. And so I, I was part of <laughs> Disruption. And they, they set us in a circle, and there were these lights around, and you know, people from all over the world were being brought in to hear about this disruption. And what they were really doing was redoing their global governance indicators, which doesn't mean they were eliminating them or radically rethinking them. They probably were tweaking them. But in any case, I seem to have been 
welcomed as a little piece of disruption into this effort to at least get the idea of redoing your governance indicators a little bit. Um, beyond that, who knows? Uh, I, I never aspired to make big changes in the world, and I, I see my work as being very much collaborative with other people, and it's been interesting to me to see how much uptake there was. The, the other thing that's really nice is that my quantification book got reviewed in the American Anthropologist by short comments from five colleagues, and if any of you one of the, many of them are funny and cute and very clever, so if you want the short snippets of what this book is about, I recommend you take a look at the, it's, I think it was last spring in the American Anthropologist. Um, but I don't think I'm going to change the tenor of the shift to quantification at all. And I, it's not that it's all, you know, some things are really quantifiable and importantly made to be that way, and others aren't. And shouldn't really be quantified at all. And I think it's finding that distinction that's really an important thing and looking at the power of trying to measure those things that are essentially unmeasurable, like happiness or well-being or things like that. But I think it's this, my theory is, is this desperate search to make the world knowable when it really isn't. You know, we'll, we'll never be able to comprehend it. And yet we still have to decide which college to go to and, you know, what what tourist destination is safest, and so on. So we just make do with this. Well, I've warned you not to go to Jamaica after that. Yeah, I'm, I'm, no way. <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm going to Honduras. That's a much better bet. <laughs> it's just occurred to me, of course, the psychology of this is all coming together. Rob was the privileged one who was going off to university won a Nobel Prize for economics, and then you write a book uh, criticizing quantification. <laughs> <laughs> and so you've sort of had your revenge. I, I'm sorry that you noticed that. <laughs> but it, it's worse because both my sister and my sister-in-law are psychologists who also believe in quantification. And there were, there were those who thought I was going to take down both fields, but I assured them that was not about to happen. <laughs> economics and psychology are alive and well, but I will say <laughs> that there are, I think that numbers are used much more responsibly within social science where you get sort of critique of where did your numbers come from and how did you use them and, and it's not like the sort of global performance indicators that Beth was talking about which just get constructed to create the world. So I think there's a real difference between just measuring things in a way where you show your methodology, you explain what you did, other people could look at your methodology, decide whether or not it's accurate or not, and redo it. And within the academic world, you know, there's always this re-examination and rethinking about whether your numbers are right and accurate. And it's when it gets into the public domain that this process doesn't happen, and I think that's where they can really become problematic. So we're still on speaking terms. <laughs> I hope. Well, now that I've exposed the real uh, <laughs> scheme of things. Um, final question, and then we should uh, have, uh, have a drink. Um, would any of your uh, peers in anthropology think that you have... Um, you, you've strayed too far away from the essence of anthropology. I mean, <laughs> going to UN conferences and sitting there and looking at, quote, the anthropology of delegates, etc. cetera, um, have you not turned into a sociologist or <laughs> uh, left behind the real uh, Margaret Median roots of the, uh, of the discipline? Well... This, of course, is, oh, do you have a great gift for the sort of d difficult issues here? Um, but anthropology itself has changed. I mean, the idea that you had to go sit in a remote village and understand that village is long since gone. And Laura Nader urged us to study up in the early 70s. And increasingly, anthropologists are looking at all sorts of you know, powerful institutions from you know, the World Trade Organization to the UN to you know, scientific laboratories. So the, the field is changing. I mean, I, I will say that my intellectual commitments are to both anthropology and the Law and Society Association, which has been a wonderful environment for me, an interdisciplinary social science, law, academics, philosophy, history, uh, we haven't really got the economists in there too much. Um, and, uh, and 
obviously sociology and political science, which has sort of taken me into a, a world which is a little bit more kind of contemporary modern institutions, um, but anthropology is there as well. And I, I don't think you'd find anybody studying villages just in that sense anymore. Uh, have I become too law in society for anthropology? I don't know. But I've, I've always done both, and, and that's been really gratifying. And some of the people who spoke today I know through law and society and some through anthropology. And I, you know, so I may not write with other people, but I do talk to other people <laughs> in different fields. Okay, I think we should uh, end it on that. I think it's a great tribute, Sally, to you that the most packed session of today is the one uh, featuring you. Um, I, I'm I, amazed, yes. I, I do want to just have one last word to say that uh, all of us, uh, at least uh, among the, her academic colleagues, think that Sally is really an absolutely marvellous person uh, in addition to being a fantastic uh, scholar, and it's been a huge privilege for us to have her here and be able to work with her. No one has been more giving, no one has been, you know, there's nothing that Sally won't attend. <laughs> I think even I've said to her, but you shouldn't go to that, you know, you don't need to be there, etc. And sure enough, Sally is there and being supportive, being encouraging, uh, and really going out of her way in every way, while at the same time making all these uh, really uh, path-breaking academic contributions. So cheers to you, and may you stay with us uh, here at NYU for a lot, lot longer. <laughs> well, thank you, and I want to thank Phil for welcoming me as a co-director of the Center for Human Rights and Global Justice, which has been really special for me, as well as being in the anthropology department. And actually, the law school has been quite welcoming in lots of ways, even though I'm actually not a card-carrying lawyer at all, as you probably can tell. So thank you so much, Phil, for doing this and organizing this, and thank you all for coming. <laughs>